Tommy Fish, I've gutted with that old yellow knife. It's been in my tackle box for, I don't know, ever since. I don't know what year that was, but it's been in my tackle box ever since. And, and I punch out my, you got to punch out your card, you got to make a little V, cut out a little V and then write the, the river number down and the number, and the date. And I guess I was born uh, April 17, 1936. My dad was Harry Sonnen, and my mom was Margaret Kaus Sonnen. Uh, my sister Margie was two years older than me, and I was born in 1936. And then da Darlene, and then there was uh, Joan and Wilma, and then there was a little boy named Edward. He died when he was two days old. And uh, and Jerry and and Kathy, I guess, was the youngest ones. We lived about three quarters of a mile away down at uh, well, they call it the Hunka place. Bob Lustig owns it now. It used to be Sonnens, but uh, it got away from us uh, in the fifties when Grandma Sonnen died. And it was forty six when we moved the house over here. And anyway. Uh, he sawed the house in two and put it up on a couple of red first kids and uh, there's a TD-14 and a TD-6 cat that pulled it over here for down the road uh, two in two pieces, you know. They got it moved up here and Dad got it put back together and I guess just jacking it back together and everything. And we lived in that house for a couple, two or three years, but then we started building this house. But when I started school at Stock Creek, uh, you know, of course, we walked to school, but I remember in school one time when Donnie, Clem Nuxle, me and Dick Ramackle, we was we couldn't have been over second, third graders, you know. And they hogtied us, tied their hands and feet up on the school porch there. And somehow I was I was wiggling off the porch and I fell down off the porch and was kind of trying to jump out around the end of school. And about that time, old Ramona Nuxall, she was a big, tall, lanky gal, and Ruth Weber, <laughs> she was a little short, stocky gal, and they was playing tag around the corner of school. And I jumped out right in their path and just go wham, you know, and they just, they just, I was just out like a light, you know, and I was laying there on the ground, and I don't know how long I laid there. And anyway, I, I finally come to, and I looked up, and. Everybody was looking at me, and I thought, "What are you? What are you people all doing at my place?" You know, <laughs> and it finally dawned on me that what happened that I was at school yet. You know, <laughs> during noon hour, the, the teacher we used to walk go up and walk on those trestles, walk across those railroad trestles. You know, and, and just think nothing of it. You know, and and uh, it was just nowadays. <laughs> Could you imagine? And we'd take, we'd put pennies on the railroad track. The train, the freight train, would come up from Lewiston, you know, or and they the freight. I don't know how many times a week, maybe three times a week. And then they they had what they called the doodle bug. It was just one little one little passenger deal that hauled mail up from Lewiston all the time. We always called it the doodle bug, and I'd I'd see it go by up here. And you could just about time it, you know, when it went a little after 12, and, and it hauled mail up, you know. But anyway, we'd take pennies up and put on the railroad tracks, you know, and then go up and pick them up the next day, and they'd be mashed out to the size of 50 cent piece or something, you know. It ended up, there was only 10, 10 kids in the whole school. It ended up, uh, the Webbers went to Ferdinand, and Nuxles, they moved to Cottonwood, and, and it was just us, Ray Mackles, and us, and Gerald Uncott. The school finally consolidated in 1949, I think, and then I went down to Green Creek School when I was in the eighth grade. Of course, when I got to Green Creek, you know, then it was, there was 42 kids in the school, and, and it was just altogether different. It was, a, for me, you know, it was, there was, there was cliques, you know, in the school, in school. I did fairly good down at Green Creek in sport and football and baseball especially. 
when I was a sophomore, Jim Beaker was our coach, and he, I was, I was playing shortstop and second base, and things like that, and he, and he taught me how to throw a curveball, you know, and and he'd gone to school down at NICE, North Idaho College of Education. It's Lewis Clark State now. So I, I started trying pitching a little bit, and I kind of perfected that curveball, and it got to be kind of fun. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd throw the ball right at the batter, and it would just curve right across the plate, you know, big, big old curve. <laughs> anyway, but I always had arm problems, and my arm would always get so sore, I couldn't even hold a cup of, cup of water up to my after practice at night. And, I remember one one time we went down to Kamii and I was playing town team ball then, and in Green Creek we went down to Kamii and first game of the year old Andy Schmidt he he kind of took me under his wing he was a good pitcher down in Green Creek in the old days anyway when I was warming up I got to throwing a, a drop he said throw that one you know so I was throwing that one and I. In seven innings, I struck out ten guys down there, uh, you know, some of the big boys, you know. And, but then my arm, you know, started started tightening up on me, you know. And finally, about the seventh inning, I finally just finally gave up a couple of runs. So they, so I had to quit pitching, and I went and played shortstop. But I always remember that because I'd struck out ten of those big college boys, you know. Well, I I met Mardell when she was she was going to school. She was a year younger than me, and and uh, oh, I don't know. I I never started really going with her until I was out of high school, and she was a junior. And anyway, I graduated from high school in uh, 1954, and I knew I was going to have to go to the army sometime, you know, and. And uh, Delmer Sonnen and Dick Von Bargen and Tommy Nuxel from Grinkirk, they was all going to volunteer for the draft and go to the Army in October that year. So I decided that I, being those guys was going, I could go with them. So I volunteered for the draft and had never been away from home, you know. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty trying, you know. We got on a train and went down to Fort Ord, California, our first eight weeks basic, and we got to come home Christmas time, and was home for two weeks. Then went back down there for another eight weeks at infantry basic, and Delmer and Dick was going to go to Korea. And anyway, when I went through the line, the guy said, uh, "Son, and just went through here. Are you related to him?" And I said, "Yeah, he's my cousin." Well, then he changed it from Okinawa to Korea for me, so I got to. Go over there. Well, Delmer, he, the, Delmer and Dick. When we got over there, they got into a different company than I did. But it was only up the road, two or three miles, and I could go up and see them. So I got into service company, and so I was driving a deuce and a half truck, you know, and, and it was, it was quite an experience, you know. We every week we'd have a different. Sometimes you'd have the water run, you know. You'd go down and get water out of, they had a pump down by the river, and you'd. You'd have a big tank, and you know you park it there at the company, and and oh, sometimes you'd have the garbage run, or sometimes the, some other run, you know. And sometimes one time we went on maneuvers and uh, up to north to D to the DMZ, you know, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, and, and I can remember that, and I, I don't know how far it was across there, but you could see the North Koreans over there, you know, their outposts. And, but, you know, we, we had a gymnasium there, and they, they played baseball over there, got on the baseball team, and, and uh, played baseball that summer. I counted the days, you know. <laughs> I was over there, it was, the tour of duty was 16 months over there, but... Uh, I don't know. I was glad to get out of there. Well, July 13th, 1957, we got married. And in those days, they, they had a wedding. You got married in the morning. Then you went had a dinner. And then you opened presents and all the old 
the old ladies would sit around there and you had to open the presents, you know, and then you had supper and, and, uh, and then a wedding dance at nine o'clock. I had my mind made up a long time ahead of time that, that I wasn't going to stay for that wedding dance. And so anyway, Mardell had her bags all packed and everything. And then, oh, I don't know, after supper that night, we went out and got her bags and everything. And we took off, took off for Moscow. <laughs> anyway, I guess at nine o'clock come along and, and uh, of course the band was there and they was wondering where we was at. And old Lee Von Bargen, he was my best man. And he finally said, well, they're not gonna be here. <laughs> And yeah, one thing I really remember about it was they had one of the damnedest hailstorms in history <laughs> that day. It was just, it was flooding down the road, into the, down by the hall there. Dad <clears throat> took his shirt off and Willie West took the shirt off, left the ties on, took the shirt off, rolled her pants legs up, and they was out there with brooms sweeping the hail and the, away from the front. <laughs> And it was a quite a, everybody kind of got a, quite a kick out of it. You know? Well, I think Cheryl was born like at 16, and then Lita, and then we moved up the other side of town, and I think Lori and Sharon, and I don't know if Sharon was born there or if she was born out at Fan. I know Sue was born at Fan. When the kids got through school, you know, and moved away. Me and Mardell, we'd, uh, every week, we'd walk into uh, different lakes, you know, maybe go up to Gospels and walk into the Knob Lakes one weekend, maybe Moores Lake the next, or Twin Lakes or somewhere. And we'd been just about, probably over, well over half all the lakes up in the Hump and the Gospels and the Trilbies back there. It was probably some of the best times of, you know, me and Mardell. Well, for me anyway, I don't know about Mardell, but I, I kind of think she enjoyed it a little bit too. But it's kind of funny, you know, and back, uh, elk and deer really wasn't plentiful or thick around here until 50, maybe the late 40s or 50s, you know. So Dad and Coop Ross and this Joe Vetter, they, we started going up the Locksaw hunting. We'd take trucks and we had horses and we'd camp down on the river and we'd camp up uh, like Canyon Creek and uh, we'd ride the horses up and shoot elk and had to walk back, but it was all downhill. You know? <laughs> so that went on for quite a while up there, but then the wolves started moving in up there, you know, or something. And then I started to, I, we started hunting up South Fork quite a bit. and and uh, Buckhorn Creek up there, uh, hunted that for quite a few years. And, but then I guess I should get in telling you about my experiences on the river when I bought a boat. Sometime in the late 60s, Frank Walski over there, he'd built an inverted V wooden boat. And he gave me a ride down to the river. That was the first time I went, he gave me a ride, he took down as far as around Briggs and he had a 50 horse. Mercury motor on it with a jet pump, and so I I wanted him to build me a boat, inverted V like that. So he did. He 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 built it, and uh, we fiberglassed it, did everything, got it all ready. And I went down to Lewiston looking for a motor for it. And when I was down there, the Deschains the Breeder they had a little 16 foot huge craft aluminum boat that had an 80 horse Mercury on it with a jet pump on it, and. So we got kind of dealing on that, and so instead of buying a motor, I just ended up buying that little 16-foot boat in 1968. First time I went down, we just went down as far as the A-hole, I guess you call it. And there was, wasn't too bad of rapids down that far. And so then the next Saturday, I told Jerry, I said, we're going to go to the White House today. So we, we did. We went down through the bunghole. With, Bunghole and the lower bunghole, they're pretty rough rapids, you know, you got to kind of kind of know how to run them. And we got down pretty close to White House there, and there was rapids down there. And, and uh, 
Well, just run right down over that. It just runs so nice and smooth down over deal there. He said, just run down over there. And so ah, I'm going to look at it. So I, I went and looked at it, walked down there, and that it was running so smooth, but there was a rock about this far under, a big rock. And if I wouldn't have looked at it, I'd run right over the top of it. And one time I ate that rock garden above the, right above the bridge. It's real bony and rocky in there going up through there. And pretty hard to get through there. And so I, with that little 16, I sometimes I got kind of curious, so I would kind of ventured up through up there a few time or two, and kind of slowly. And, and Jerry, he'd kind of stand up and oh, this way, this way, you know. And see, when you're down at water level, you can't see those rocks or anything. One time I went down, I went up Pete's on Pete's driveway road going up there, and it sets a couple hundred feet up up from the river. And I sat there for a long time, and I studied that from the bridge on up, up to, you know, through the rock garden there. And I figured, you know, I memorized how I had to go through there. I had to go up between two rocks and then take a sharp left. There was a deep spot there, you know. And as soon as you got through that sharp left, you, you could make it, you know. I mean, just follow the channels, read the channels. And so every once in a while, we'd have little extra gas or something coming back up to Bells, I'd tell Jerry, well, let's run up to Pete's. So we'd, we'd run up through there, you know. And, and I'm kind of glad I did now or then because one time Jean Green, she, uh, Jack Green was a cowboy foreman across the river and Jean Green was, anyway, she'd come out to Cottonwood. And anyway, at night she went back and she ran into the river right across from Pete Johnson's. And, when we got down there, there was quite a crowd there ready, and they said Bud Romaine was on his way over from Grainville. He lived at Grainville, but he had his boat down at Bells. He had a kind of a dock he built down there. He, and he had it tied up to that dock, and so he come along there, and he he said, "Well, he said I I don't know how to get up through there through there." He said, "I'd have to get my trailer and everything." And I said, "Oh, I said I know how to get through there." So I jumped in with him, me and Jim Madden, we jumped in with him and went down and I, I, I got, told him how to get up through there and we got up through there. I was pretty lucky running the river. I, I'd run pretty well the same path every time except once in a while, you know, the, you'd have to, have to learn to read the river. You know, most of the big rapids down there, I could kind of sneak, it didn't have to go right down the middle of them, I kind of sneak along the edge of them where the, with that little light boat, you know. And I was I was pretty lucky, I guess, a few times. We raise a big garden every year, always have, but uh, I get comments about, oh, your garden looks so good and everything. And, but uh, I, I always tell them, you know, if it wouldn't be for my five daughters, <laughs> the last four or five years especially, that garden wouldn't look near so good because they do 90% of the work anymore. After Mardell died, well, she's been gone a little over five years now, I guess. And she was a hard little worker. So her lungs finally gave out on her. We finally, so she'd end up in the hospital every winter. It seemed like maybe once or twice with pneumonia or something. And I think we, I think we all thought that she was still gonna come back, you know. Uh, but yeah, she was a tough little woman. I say my prayers every night. I'd say a prayer for Mardell every night. And I figure, I figure this kingdom out there is my church, you know, the river and the, the hills. And if I'm feeling down or something like that, snap me out of this, you know, and it seems like something will happen that I'll start feeling better or something, you know. It's just, it's just almost like a miracle, you know. And I, I thank the Lord every day for miracles he's done for me.